Sharon Blackburn. I'm a United States District Judge for the Northern District of Alabama, and I am a guest at the conference of uh, my nine-tenths better half, Judge Tom Martin. So uh, it's my honor to introduce to you uh, the next two speakers, both of whom are personal heroes of mine, and I'm fortunate enough to also call them both friends, Bill Baxley and Doug Jones. Bill Baxley was elected Attorney General of the State of Alabama at age 28. Remarkably, he was already a seasoned prosecutor, having tried dozens of jury trials as the district of attorney of two Alabama counties. He served as Alabama's attorney general from 1971 to 1979, and as the court's, uh, I mean, as Alabama's lieutenant governor from 1983 to 1987. As attorney general, Bill uh, served as lead trial counsel in every major um, action tried by the state of Alabama in both civil and criminal um, actions. He also appointed the state's first African-American assistant attorney general, Myron Thompson, who later became and currently serves as a United States district judge in Montgomery, Alabama. It's also important to note that during the years he was a attorney general, he hired more than 50% of all women and all African-American attorneys then practicing in the state of Alabama. His successful prosecution of Klansman Robert Chambliss for the 1963 bombing of uh, Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church, you'll hear a little bit, a lot more about that in a few minutes, is featured in Spike Lee's documentary, Four Little Girls. His legal accomplishments are also documented in Lay Down with Dogs, Until Justice Rolls Down, and numerous other publications. He has five children with his wife, Marie. His three youngest sons are named after iconic judges of the Fifth and Eleventh Circuit, Richard Reeves Baxley, Robert Vance Box Baxley, and uh, uh, Frank Johnson Baxley. There's no way to overstate the enormous respect and admiration for Bill Baxley in the bar of the state of Alabama. Doug Jones was the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama from 1997 to 2001, and he currently serves as the Vice President of the National Association of Former U.S. Attorneys. In January 1998, just five months after he took office, Doug received national attention as United States Attorney when a bomb exploded at a Birmingham Women's Health Clinic, killing a police officer and seriously wounding a nurse. Doug coordinated the investigative task force that included the FBI, the ATF, and the Birmingham Police Department that led to the indictment of Eric Robert Rudolph. Rudolph was also determined to be responsible for three bombings in the Atlanta, Georgia area, including the 1996 the Atlanta Centennial Olympic Park bombing, and was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list until he was captured in 1983, excuse me, 2003. In 2005, Rudolph pled guilty and was of all bombings and is serving a life without parole sentence. Doug was again the focus of national attention, media attention, as the federal prosecutor in the prosecution of the historic cold case involving the 1963 bombings of the 16th Street Baptist Church, again, that you'll hear about in a few minutes. He has been honored for his work by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the NAACP, the FBI, uh, and numerous other um, organizations. Even with his incredibly busy law practice and often high-profile cases, he somehow finds a time to work to improve the administration of justice. Uh, two examples. In 2014, he co-chaired a blue ribbon panel of current and former federal prosecutors for the Brennan Center for Justice that produced a white paper entitled Federal Prosecution for the 21st Century. <clears throat> he also, in 2015, was a founding member of Law Enforcement Leaders to Reduce Crime and Incarceration, calling for significant reform of the nation's criminal justice system. At the end of this presentation, I think you will understand why I asked to present the next two um, uh, presenters and why I hold them both in the highest regard. Please join me in welcoming Bill Baxley and Doug Jones. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Judge. Um, we really appreciate being here. I'm Doug Jones. I'm, I'm, I'm always the better looking of the two of us that do this dog and pony show. But, um, we're especially glad. We would have only come out here on February 1st because of Judge Blackburn here, because February 1st is now a, nas a state holiday in the state of Alabama because it's National Signing Day for high school football recruits. <laughs> so Bill has been following it all morning. Uh, 
the way we do this program, um, Bill was the attorney general in the 1970s and prosecuted the first of the church bombing cases, a fellow named uh, uh, Bob Chambliss. And um, I later, as U.S. attorney, prosecuted uh, two guys, two cases, Bobby Frank Cherry and Tommy Blanton. And so I'll, I'll, I'm going to go first and talk about Birmingham in the 1960s, 50s and 60s, uh, and set the stage and talk about a little bit about what was going on and how that came that bombing really came to pass. Uh, and as we get through the bombing itself, I'll turn it over to Bill to let him talk about his cases, and then I'll get back up here. Now, we, we tend to talk. We're our lawyers after all, so we never know when to really shut up. So if you'll hang with us, we'll, prob- we'll promise to try to keep this on time, but I promise you if you'll stay with us, uh, it'll be worth your while in the end. So with that, I'll tell you that um, when we started these cases, at least in 2001 and 2002, my office did a lot of, of jury work. You heard uh, Randy and some others this morning talking about focus groups. We did a lot of focus groups. And what we determined, this was 37, 30 years after the fact, was that in Alabama, in, in the heart of the Bible Belt, that uh, our potential jury pool felt like that not only the girls that got killed, four young African-American girls that got killed in this bombing that occurred on a Sunday morning, not only were they the victims of this crime, but also the house of worship, the church itself. People have such um, strong feelings about the places where they worship, whether it's their church, their synagogue, or their mosque, that we actually decided that we would talk about the church uh, as the fifth victim uh, of this case. And so all of these cases start with the 16th Street Baptist Church. If you ever get to Birmingham, please come visit. It's right across the street from the Civil Rights Institute in Kelly Ingram Park, which you'll see some pictures of in a moment, and it's a remarkable place. The church today is very vibrant. It's still active. Um, this photograph, as you see, is Exhibit 1 that we used. And by the way, even though I was the U.S. attorney, I ended up prosecuting these cases uh, in state court. We couldn't quite make the federal jurisdiction. So we moved the Cherry case and the Blanton case over to state court, which is really where these cases should have always been. The style of these cases should have always been the state of Alabama versus Tommy Blanton and the state of Alabama versus Bobby Cherry, just like it was state of Alabama versus Bob Chambliss, because, frankly, it was the state of Alabama and the system of justice that existed at the time that really let people down in the 1950s and 1960s. But the church is very much like it is uh, today. It was very much like it was in 1963 with one big exception. If you look at the very bottom uh, left-hand corner, uh, no, right-hand corner of that photograph, uh, hopefully you'll be able to see there's some concrete steps. And those steps were there uh, in the 1950s and 60s. They'd been there for many years. But those steps haven't been there since the early morning hours of September 15th. 1963 when a bomb that was placed right underneath the bottom step outside that church, outside the window of the ladies' lounge, uh, exploded. So the church is the centerpiece. But like all of you lawyers that try cases, civil or criminal, you know, you can't just rely on everything that you have in a file. I had an enormous file that we looked uh, at and to go through. Documents, photographs, interviews, you name it. But we also had to do a little bit of history in this case had to understand a little bit why it was potentially that this church was targeted for this particular bomb, why it was that potentially the children of this church were targeted. And so we really started looking at an awful lot of history about Birmingham and what was going on in the city of Birmingham. And we looked at racial violence of the time. And what we determined was that so much of the racial violence in this country in the 50s and 60s was the direct result of the work of lawyers who produced school desegregation cases. When courts ordered schools to integrate, it was met with such white resistance that violence often erupted. And that all stemmed back from the 1954 decision of Brown versus Board when the Supreme Court said separate schools are no longer equal schools. The Brown decision that originated right here in Kansas. Well, the fact of the matter is Schools didn't desegregate with all deliberate speed. It took a long, long time, in in, in some cases, decades. But in 1957, one of the great leaders of the civil rights movement, one of the unsung heroes of the movement, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth in Birmingham, decided he was going to test this law. He was going to try to enroll his kids in an all-white high school in Birmingham, Alabama. 
And Fred was an incredibly brave civil rights soldier. And he always announced what he was going to do. So he announced he was going to enroll his kids in Phillips High School, which was in downtown Birmingham, one of the most prominent high schools and white high schools in the state of Alabama. And when he got there, he was met with a mob of people. Now, there happened to be a young man there who had just graduated from Phillips, was going to UAB and needed to get his high school transcript. And he was also a budding newsman working for our local PBS station. And when he saw this crowd, he figured something was going to happen, so he went and grabbed an old movie camera. For, you, for the gray hairs in there like, like me, you know what I'm talking about. It wasn't a video camera. It was an old 8-millimeter movie camera that you'd have to develop and put on reel-to-reels. And he, he, he took what he thought was going to be a significant event, and it was. And I want to play a portion of that for you and hopefully try to stop it. All right, if you'll watch the man in the white shirt that just reached in his pocket, you'll see him come around right in there. Uh, the man in the white shirt got back into the fray. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth is chased up and down the sidewalk. He was beaten. His wrist was broken. His wife, who was there with him, was stabbed by, with a pocket knife in her hip. Now, the man in the white shirt, and I didn't get a chance to stop it. Sometimes technology, as great as it is, doesn't always help you out. Um, the one I wanted to show you was right in the center. And he was a focal point of the case. But I want, before I mention him, I want you really to think about this in the context of a lot of what we just heard a few moments ago. Fred Shuttlesworth was a man of God. He was a man of faith out of the incredible number of people I've had to meet that I've had the opportunity to meet of faith. He was probably the most devout man of faith I've ever met. And here was a preacher who was trying to get his children a better education and that's the mentality he was met with. Now he was making a point. Nonetheless, he was making a point. But still, that is the mentality of what he was met with just to get a, an equal education for his children. And the man in the white shirt that if you noticed he reached in his pocket and pulled out something and then went back into the fight. That man was Bobby Frank Cherry, who I would later prosecute. He had no children in that school, but felt compelled to violence. Those were brass knuckles. He reached in his pocket to hit this preacher to stop school desegregation. And so the first piece of a puzzle of the trial that I would try kind of falls into place. Now over the next few years, Birmingham was a cauldron of civil rights hostility. The civil right, as the civil rights movement grew, so did the violence against the black community. Bombings, brutal beatings. In 1961, the Freedom Riders came through Birmingham and stopped at the Greyhound bus station on, on uh, Mother's Day, 1961. Their bus had been firebombed by the Klan just an hour out of Birmingham in Anniston. Almost killed them, but for their brave state troopers who started firing shots to let the people out of the bus. But when they pulled up in Birmingham, in 1961, on Mother's Day, there was not a police officer in sight. Not one police officer for some 20 minutes. The Klan had their way, with the, again, with the sticks, the chains, uh, brutally beating uh, the Freedom Riders. It took 20 minutes for the police officers to get there. And by the way, just as a matter of, of curiosity uh, and trivia, there's a very famous FBI informant, and the, and the, the very large butt that you see right in the middle of that photograph belongs to actually an FBI informant named Gary Thomas Rowe, who was an informant for the FBI at the time that he participated in those beatings. But the infamous police commissioner of Birmingham, Bull Connor, one of three commissioners, had made a deal with the Klan that he would not have his police officers show up for 20 minutes to allow these beatings. When asked by the media, why they, there were no police officers there when everyone knew the schedule. He famously said, well, it was Mother's Day. They were all visiting their mamas, and we had to call them in. True story. But now, Birmingham uh, leaders decided to make a change. When those images got flashed around the world, the, the business leaders of Birmingham decided that enough was enough. They were seeing their city die. The reputation of Birmingham was becoming so bad that they decided to take matters into their own hand. They were in Japan at a Rotary convention and they saw the reaction of their colleagues about what was being shown in Birmingham with, with all the beatings at the Greyhound bus station. 
And they came back and decided to change the form of government and get rid of Bull Connor. And in the fall of 62, the citizens of Birmingham decided to go from a three-member commission to a uh, mayor and city council form of government. The problem was uh, he was going to, Bull Connor was going to run for mayor. Now, at the same time that vote was taking place, Fred Shuttlesworth was in Atlanta talking to Dr. King about bringing the movement to Birmingham in a dramatic way. Dr. King had had hard times in Albany and a few other places, and the civil rights movement was teetering a little bit. And, and Reverend Shuttlesworth told Dr. King, you come to Birmingham and desegregate the most segregated city in America, and we will be on the road to success. And so they decided to come to Birmingham with what was going to be known as Project C, Project Confrontation, in the spring. But it, there, that vote was going to be taking place in Birmingham in February. And it, they knew that if they came at that time that Bull Connor would likely get elected. So they postponed the march. Bull Connor's in a runoff. They postponed it again. And finally, Connor is defeated, but he doesn't leave office. There's all sorts of lawsuits going on about that. And so Connor decides that he would stay uh, in office. And they came to Birmingham anyway. And that's what you have seen, everybody that's looked at the Birmingham history, the images of black and white. You see what happened and what later became known as the children's marches. Because it was the children of Birmingham, the kids. Dr. King went to jail, wrote the famous letter from a Birmingham jail. But it was the kids who made a difference. Because the schools would empty out and they would meet at the 16th Street Baptist Church in the spring of 1963 to learn and what to do when faced with a violent crowd for, an, for what they were going to do is a very nonviolent, peaceful march. And they met at the 16th Street Baptist Church. And from there they walked out peacefully. They were just going to go to City Hall. They would walk out and no sooner had they got into the intersection or across the street at Kelly Ingram Park than Bull Connor had his fire hoses and the dogs uh, waiting on them. You've all seen these pictures, I'm sure, if you've done any history about the South and the Civil Rights Movement, but you've seen the pictures. Bull Connery even had a water tank, a tank. All this military equipment that police officers use today started in Birmingham with Bull Connor's tank that he famously painted white. It never rumbled through the white neighborhoods of Birmingham. The dogs would attack as soon as the folks got in to the, uh, into the street. This is the most famous picture. It is the photograph that hit on the front page of most papers around the country and the one that President Kennedy said that made him physically ill and got him working on the Civil Rights Act that would later be passed after his death in 1964. Bull Connor just didn't hit with police, and, uh, with police dogs and fire hoses. He also started making arrests. At one point, there were literally thousands of teenagers that filled the jails of Birmingham, so many that they had to make a makeshift jail at, at, at Fair Park, which is where our state fair would meet once a year. Now, behind the scenes, what was going on with those business leaders were once again meeting because they had, they had successfully gotten Connor voted out of office. But now, all of a sudden, Birmingham was once again in the media spotlight in a really bad way. Teenagers getting hit with fire hoses, getting attacked by dogs. There are films of these kids getting hit with fire hoses on the sidewalk, rushing them down the sidewalk like it was a pressure washer of some type. And so the leaders met with Dr. King to forge a very modest settlement to end these marches in the spring of 63. This is Dr. King, Reverend Shuttlesworth, Reverend Abernathy announcing what would be a very modest settlement to do away with some of the Jim Crow laws that were unique to Birmingham, like that it was illegal, a crime punishable by, by jail for a black man and a white man to be caught playing checkers together in public. It took down the white and colored signs and the, uh, around the city, uh, around the lunch counters and the restrooms and the water fountains that should have been down anyway. It didn't go as far as hire, uh, requiring the city to hire black police officers. That wouldn't come for some time later, but even with that very modest settlement, the Klan was not happy. This is a photograph of Robert Shelton. Robert Shelton was the uh, head of the United Clans of America. I can never forget his title. He was like the imperial wizard, grand dragon, super duper poopa person uh, of the Klan. They had, they had these mile long names for themselves. Uh, and he was the head of the United Clans of America, one of the largest Klan organizations, and he announced on television after this settlement 
that it would be Dr. King's epitaph. And sure enough, that night a bomb exploded at the A.G. Gaston Motel where Dr. King had been staying. Fortunately, he had left and gone back home uh, and no one was injured. But now the die was cast, more pieces of the puzzle were falling into place. First of all, the Klan was unhappy. They were seeing their segregated way of life sliding away. Second, the church and the children were as much of the objects of the civil rights movement. They were the poster children, so to speak, of the civil rights movement. They were the image of the civil rights movement from that point on. And when you became the image of the civil rights movement, when you became the face of the movement in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963 with the Klan becoming so violent, you may as well put a bullseye on yourself. The church and the children were the symbols of the movement and thus had bullseye on their front, uh, on their chest, and on their back. And the Klan became, did, in fact, do more violence. Two weeks after this settlement, a bomb exploded at the home of A.D. King, Reverend uh, Martin Luther King's brother who was preaching in Birmingham. Two weeks later, in early June, George Wallace, our governor, stood in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama to block two kids, Vivian Malone and James Hood, from enrolling in the University of Alabama. Now, in, history will tell you that that was all staged. There was no way on God's green earth that he was going to stop federal marshals from enrolling those kids at the University of Alabama. That's Nicholas Katzenbach that you see in that uh, photograph. The man on the far right is Macon Weaver, who was the U.S. attorney, one of my predecessors. But when George Wallace stood aside and let those kids enroll, the Klan was once again angry. They didn't realize that there were armed Klansmen around Tuscaloosa waiting for the race war to begin which is always interesting when I say that. I said it for years, and until Dylan Roof shot up people in a church, nobody really used that term much more. And all of a sudden, it came back, as so many things are coming back these days. Well, he stepped aside, and the Klan was angry again. And by the way, for those of you that don't know this, uh, Vivian Malone from Mobile, Alabama, her sister Sharon uh, Malone, a friend of mine, and my friend Barry Grissom, a former U.S. attorney over here, um, is married to Eric Holder, the first African-American uh, Attorney General of the United States. They've been back many times to honor uh, Vivian. That summer, there were more bombings in Birmingham, culminated probably 40 bombings over a 15-year period in Birmingham. More violence as the, as the movement grew, so did the Klan violence. Uh, in August and uh, September, Arthur Shores, who was one of our great lawyers, later became the first African-American on the Birmingham City Council. His home was bombed twice that summer. Uh, his daughter just recently retired as one of our circuit judges. This is a photograph of the second uh, Shores home that, that was bombed. In early August, Dr. King is on the mall with 300,000 people uh, delivering the I Have a Dream speech and hope is really in the air. Hope everywhere is in the air that this movement is about to succeed. But in Birmingham, once again, the cauldron was bubbling because, see, after Fred Shuttlesworth was beaten and not allowed to enroll his kids at Phillips, a lawsuit was filed. The lawyers took charge once again to do the right thing. And it took about six years for that lawsuit to desegregate Birmingham schools to go up and down to the old Fifth Circuit. And in August of 1963, the court ruled that Birmingham schools had to desegregate. Uh, George Wallace once again tried to block it. He didn't stand in the schoolhouse door this time, but he had a state trooper circle an elementary school to try to stop two kids. And our district court, in a very brave move, issued an in-bank opinion among all our district court judges to stop that initiative injunction. But even with all of that, this is what was going on outside every school system uh, every school, white school in Birmingham. All the Confederate battle flags flying, all of the protests, and I've said this for years, just even before all the Confederate battle flag stuff hit, that if you, if you don't understand and fully understand that the battle flag has been co-opted by white supremacy groups, you have to only look at these uh, photographs. And I've got, a, I've got a, a, a newspaper, by the way, in my backpack if you want to see it, where a white supremacist group in 1965 was selling Confederate battle flags, and they said on there that it, it is no longer a symbol of, his, of, of sectional pride, it is a symbol of white supremacy, and wear it proudly. So whenever you hear people like Steve Bannon talking about 
that it's just a, a symbol of heritage, remember that people, other people that use it for bad purposes have saying other things, and it's not, not good. On September the 10th, just a few days before this bombing, these two young men walked into Graymont Elementary School. Dwight and Floyd Armstrong were the plaintiffs in the case. They had actually replaced their siblings who had outgrown the case lasted so long. You see Reverend Shuttlesworth leading the parade. That's their father, James Armstrong, with a file right behind him. He was a barber in Birmingham. One of our great foot soldiers carried the flag in the Selma to Montgomery March a couple years later. Man on the far left is Oscar Adams. Oscar was one of the lawyers on the case. One of our great lawyers, a friend of mine and Bill's, he's passed away now. He later became the first African-American on the Alabama Supreme Court and actually won a statewide election to hold on to that seat. So with the desegregation of Birmingham schools, once again, the children, the children are the targets. You can imagine the hate that these kids incurred when they sat down in their fifth grade and their sixth grade schools in an elementary school uh, that day. And so now, once again, they're at the focal point of the movement. And on September 15th, Reverend John Cross had decided that he wanted to bring the kids back to the 16th Street Church, not for purposes of civil rights and freedom, but simply to worship, which is what you do at a church. And so he was gonna have a series of youth worship services. Once a month, the kids were going to conduct the services. And that Sunday morning, some of the members of the church who were going to participate gathered downstairs in the basement in the ladies' lounge. This is Addie Mae Collins. Addie Mae was 14 years old. It's an older picture of Addie Mae. We didn't have too many of her. She came to Sunday school and church with her sisters that morning, all excited, went down there to get ready, joined some of their friends, Cynthia Morris Wesley. Cynthia is an interesting story because she had uh, seven or eight brothers and sisters and her dad had abandoned the family and her mom couldn't handle them and a social worker had seen something special about Cynthia and convinced her to live with the Wesleys who had no children. They were educators and they took Cynthia to uh, 16th Street. After her, they come to love Cynthia like their own and after her death, they, they had another 14 year old come as a replacement. And that young lady grew up, went to college, got a doctorate in psychology very successful practice the last time I talked to her in Dallas, Texas. And when you see Shirley, Dr. Shirley Wesley King, the replacement for Cynthia Wesley, you see you really get a sense of what we lose when children in this country die and the opportunities that we have with them. A really fascinating story with them, I think. Then there was Denise McNair. Denise was the youngest. She was 11, almost 12 years old, the daughter of Chris and Maxine McNair, who are friends of mine, uh, in bills as well. And this photograph, I, I used this photograph in my trial because it was a photograph that Chris, her father, had taken of Denise one day. He was a photographer by trade. And he said in the Spike Lee film that uh, uh, Judge Blackburn referred to that this was his favorite picture. And we had been friends for so long I used it. But then, and we'll talk about it later, this, this picture seems to capture so much more about uh, the cases. And finally, Carol Robertson. Carol was 14 years old as well, the daughter of Alpha and Al Robertson, a, a dancer. And these young girls were simply downstairs in the ladies' lounge doing what young girls would normally do in trying to get ready for what they considered to be a performance with the youth worship service. And about 1022, Official time, 1022. This clock says it's 1025. That bomb exploded right outside the window of the ladies' lounge. This is a clock that was across the street at the laundry that was owned by Denise McNair's grandfather, Mr. Pippin. And, you know, you always see these photographs. It doesn't matter whether it's 9-11 or the Boston Marathon bombing. You'll see a watch. You'll see a clock that's so symbolic of how time stood still, and it certainly stood still for Birmingham, uh, and I think for this country for so, so long uh, after this bombing. This was a very powerful blast. Uh, we're not sure exactly what it was. We believe it was dynamite. Dynamite was plentiful. The FBI couldn't really determine that, but it was a very powerful blast. If you look over to the right, you'll see uh, what is now a window. It was a door at that point, and the 
steps that I re you saw earlier went straight across in, the, in front of that window where those gentlemen are standing. That was the window to the ladies' lounge. It blew debris everywhere. It blew out windows across the street at the rooming houses and the uh, businesses that were right across the street, 16th Street from the church. Debris flew back up. You can see how it completely destroyed uh, the windows or the steps themselves. It blew back into the windows on the 16th Street uh, directly above where the blast happened. The debris was bouncing off cars and everywhere else and the concussion of the bomb bouncing off the brick back into and destroyed the windows. And this is obviously the most famous picture from this tragedy that morning. As you know, the civil rights movements grew up in the black churches. And if you look closely, this, it's an incredible stained glass window on the 16th Street side of the church. But on this day, on this tragedy, only the face of Christ had the most significant damage. And you can imagine the symbolism that had for people of the church and the community. And it still evokes emotion when people see the picture in the basement. Inside the uh, church, the adult Sunday school classes were meeting in the uh, sanctuary. The church had gotten so large. There were some 26 people that were injured. Uh, fortunately, no one was injured very bad, but it filled the sanctuary with soot and debris uh, and flying glass, destroying the, the windows that came through. On the outside, you can see how the cars that were parked right there on the curb were destroyed. This car was just, just crumpled by the blast itself, while this one, you can see how the brick and mortar flew through the sheet metal on that old uh, Chevrolet, and again, across the street, all the windows blown out. Concrete steps completely obliterated. And a crater, which is where the bomb technicians call the place where the, the bomb was actually placed. That examination revealed that that bomb went through 18 inches of concrete foundation for the church. It was a very, very powerful blast for the day. And that was important for my case because at one point the defense tried to say that it was thrown from a car. They had found a, a member of the church who had been standing outside about a half a block away when the blast occurred. And just before the bomb exploded, he had seen a station wagon ride by slowly with two Confederate flags on it. And when it got to uh, Fifth Avenue uh, North, it turned and, and just kind of peeled out real quick. Uh, fast, and then the bomb exploded. So the theory of the defense was some, well, this was, this was not their car. It was not the defendant's car. And so the bomb was thrown out of this car that didn't belong to any of the suspects or defendants. This bomb was far too big to throw, much less throw a big bomb and roll right underneath uh, the bottom step. So we, we had a lot of, uh, we recreated this bomb using dynamite, which is what we think it was. Bomb completely destroyed the ladies' lounge. This is from inside looking out. You can see on this wall that the wall was completely blown away, exposing the steps, the back steps that led up to the sanctuary. Uh, these photographs, this one and the next one, were taken right after the bodies were removed. That's where these young girls were simply getting ready. And the sink that you see over there becomes such an important part of the story uh, for the cases that both of us try later on. Now, early on, there were suspects in this case. Um, there was a group of Klansmen who seemed to be more active than others. One of them was Robert Chambliss, uh, who Bill would later prosecute. He worked for the city of Birmingham, thought to be involved in a lot of the bombings because he used to brag about his expertise in bombings and demolitions. And he was known affectionately by his Klan brothers as Dynamite Bob Chambliss. He was thought to be involved in a lot of the bombings, but there was very little investigation going on. One of his protégés was Tommy Blanton, who I would later prosecute. This is a photograph of Blanton after he was interviewed by the FBI in October of 63. Photograph of Blanton right before his trial uh, at a hearing in 2001. And then the man on the video that you saw, Bobby Frank Cherry, who was a truck driver, uh, was thought to maybe have uh, supplied some of the dynamite uh, Chambliss, I mean, Cherry would run his mouth a lot. Here's a photograph of Cherry right before his trial in 2002. And these guys were all Klansmen, but they were part of a splinter group. There was a splinter group that would meet underneath, underneath a bridge. The, the photograph you see is of the Cahaba River Bridge. The old one is in the foreground there. There's a new one. 
It's right outside of Birmingham. And the old one has been there for a long, long time. And these guys would leave their clan meetings. Uh, they were all members of Eastview 13 uh, Clavern uh, of the clan, which met at the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge uh, in Birmingham. True story. And they would meet underneath this bridge like a bunch of damn trolls or something to try to, you know, talk dirty. And they would get, get all riled up. And, and at some point after this, we would all go and they, they would do missionary work after their meetings. Mission, if, you, if you study anything about the clan, you'll know that the doctrine of the clan, as bizarre as it is, is based on the Bible. And their idea of a missionary work would be to take the first black man they could see off the street and just beat the crap out of him just to keep people in their place and to let folks know that they could. And there were a lot of activity at the, at the bridge on the weekend before and the weekend of the bombing, as well as the modern sign shop. The modern sign shop was a few blocks away, and it was where the owner let the clan come and do their civil rights bumper stickers and George Wallace bumper stickers and all of those kind of anti-civil rights programs. And there was testimony that we had about all the activity of the individuals, Chambliss, Cherry, Blanton, and others at the sign shop and at the bridge uh, that weekend before and the week of the bombing. Unfortunately, despite an incredible effort by the FBI, and I do mean that sincerely, J. Edgar Hoover and his FBI in the 60s took a lot of grief because they were no friends of the movement. Hoover wasn't, so it was assumed that he didn't do, uh, he only halfway did a job on this case, which is not true. Uh, they poured resources and resources and resources, and agent after agent came through and did a phenomenal job. Without them, we would not have been successful. But the fact of the matter is, the Klan, the Klan just clammed up, and they couldn't make the case. There are thousands of unsolved homicides, and they couldn't make the case. So for a federal court purposes, in 1968, the five-year statute of limitations ran, and J. Edgar Hoover closed the file. But they didn't know, two years later, there was going to be a young attorney general elected from the state of Alabama. He had been a district attorney at age 25, and in 1970, at the age of 28, uh, Bill Baxley is elected as Alabama's attorney general, one of the youngest. And yes, I... I, that is Bill when he was attorney general. It's not his junior high school photograph, I promise. <laughs> he is elected. And what, they didn't, what folks didn't know is he had a personal feeling and connection to this case. And he reopened the case of the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing the moment he got into office. Uh, and I'm going to let Bill come now and talk to you about his cases. Thank you. Thank you, Doug, and thank you so much, uh, Judge Blackburn and Judge Martin, for inviting us. Doug, y'all take that down. It's too big of a contrast. <laughs> um, I usually start by telling people uh, why they, a little bit about my background, because you might wonder how I came about the feelings that I do about civil rights. My family has roots as deep in Alabama as any, anybody's. I was born and educated uh, in the segregated in public schools from the first day of school to the last day of law school. All four of my great-grandfathers fought for the South. In fact, I never went any further north uh, than either Chattanooga or Memphis, Tennessee until after I was already in law school, over 21 years old, and that was to Kansas City. I came to a fraternity convention at the uh, Mulebach Hotel. And I tell that by people wondering how I got my views on civil rights. And they expect me to tell that I had some experience, kind of like uh, uh, St. Paul on the road to Damascus that opened my eyes. But it, it's, and it would be a good story, but it didn't happen. I, as far back as my memory goes, I always felt like I did as, as a youngster about how wrong it was to treat people uh, horribly because of the color of their skin. And I reckon it's due to my, uh, the, the, I went to the Methodist church and my parents uh, were good people and they taught us to respect people. But as I got older and got in high school, uh, I started getting more outspoken about it when uh, demonstrations started happening. And my dad, would, in spite of being a very good person, and he would caution me always, uh, son, you better watch what you saying, uh, you just, there's nothing you can do about this, and you better watch what you say, because you're going to ruin yourself. There's nothing you can do. 
And I bet you he must have told me that 20, 25 times, especially as I got older and got in college. Uh, he said, I'm glad you feel like you do, but you're going to ruin yourself being so vocal. So I was in law school at the time of that bomb went off that Doug described on the 15th of September. And I remember exactly where I was. I was getting ready to uh, eat lunch and watch pro football over at my fraternity house. And it came over the news that there had been a bomb at a church, and then it came quickly that there had been some deaths, and uh, I lost my appetite. Couldn't eat when I found out some little children had been killed in church. And later that evening or that night, I made a vow to myself that I wanted to do something about that. Now, you've got to understand what I envisioned being able to do when I, when I made that vow was I thought maybe the, the feds might make a case. I knew the state wouldn't. And what I envisioned I might be able to do was go up and volunteer to write briefs, tote briefcases for them, uh, run errands, bring coffee and Cokes and cigarettes and hamburgers and hot dogs to the agents or whatever. I, I, that's what I envisioned being able to do about it. But five years passed and the federal government didn't make a case. A little over six years later, though, by a lot of luck and a lot of being at the right place at the right time, a lot of help from good people, uh, I got elected Attorney General of Alabama. And the Attorney General of Alabama, organically, I think, has more power than any other Attorney General in the 50 states. Uh, he or she, but we haven't had a she yet. We haven't had a, a, a groundbreaker like uh, Judge Blackburn, the Attorney General. But anyway, he or she can uh, take over any case or inst uh, instigate any case or call any grand jury anywhere in the state can take over from local authorities, move people in, come in himself, uh, although nobody ever went in themselves until I got to be there. Uh, they, would, they could send people in. And so the night before I got sworn in, uh, in January of uh, 71, they had issued us uh, credentials, uh, a badge and a commission and several other things, uh, handbooks and uh, one of the things they issued us was a, uh, a card. This was before the days of the 800 number. And they issued a card that uh, had uh, numbers of all the uh, major cities in Alabama. And if you call that telephone number, uh, it would ring at the state switchboard. Then you, in turn, would tell the little lady that worked at the state switchboard, ring me my office or dial another number for me. Or dial, and if you were in Huntsville, you could say dial a number in Mobile for me. Or, uh, they could patch you in. So that's the way you would communicate when you were on the road. So I knew uh, that I was going to be using that card quite a bit, more than probably any other piece of uh, document that I had. So I turned it over on the back, and I remembered what I would thought about that case. And I said, if I have one goal that I want to accomplish in this as attorney general, I want to uh, try to do what I promised myself I'd do, except this time I can really do something about it other than carrying, uh, running errands and, and, and uh, carrying law books for somebody. And I want to try to solve that case. So I wrote on that card because I knew I, I wanted to remind me uh, the names of those four little girls on the back of that card. And every time that, uh, that I used it, I wanted to be reminded that, that that was a goal that I wanted to make sure uh, we didn't forget. Uh, as you can see, it uh, got the top of it, the, the first little girl's name, but, but just by being pulling in and out of my uh, wallet, uh, it, it wore her name off. But uh, So I carried that with me the whole time I was Attorney General, and, and every time I, uh, which was often, I looked at it, I knew what, uh, what I needed to do. Well, shortly after uh, being sworn in, within a couple of weeks, I sent over and got the files uh, on the, from the state troopers on the... Uh, the bombing. And a short time after that, I got files, a copy of the files from the Birmingham Police Department and from the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. And so we started to work. I put a team together and we started to work on that case. And it's incredible now to believe this, but most everything in all of those files was absolutely worthless because most of the man hours at the state and local level had been devoted to this crazy theory that the blacks had bombed their own church in order to get sympathy for their cause. 
And it's hard to believe now that that was what, where most of the effort was spent. But there were some pretty good thing nuggets in there that later on came back to help us. And uh, so it wasn't uh, useless. But our first suspect uh, was a guy named J.B. Stoner. And that's J.B. Stoner there. He was in Birmingham on the weekend of the bombing, and he was one of the worst racists in the history of the country, the worst anti-Semite, I think. And he, he was horribly anti-Semitic. And he had a group called the National States Rights uh, Conference. And it was part of the Klan as well. And so we spent several months uh, on a tip that Stoner had done it. And it turned out, although Stoner and his group had done a lot of bombings in the Southeast, quite a few, he bombed, for instance, the Jewish temple in, in Atlanta. Uh, they set off a bomb at the temple in Birmingham, but it didn't go off, thank goodness. It turned out that although he'd done a lot of bombings, he didn't do that one. But we spent eight or nine months or so uh, chasing Stoner. It was a, kind of a wild goose chase, but it wasn't wasted time because we did find out that Stoner uh, had bombed Reverend Shuttlesworth's church back in 57. So we indicted Stoner and ultimately convicted him for uh, bombing Reverend Shuttlesworth's church. So it wasn't a waste of time. I, I will digress just a minute, though, to tell you something uh, I'm kind of proud of. We did some real creative charging. Uh, under the, the statute of limitations in Alabama, uh, if, if a bomb does not injure or kill anybody, uh, the statute is either five or 10 years, I forget. Uh, so the statute on that, thank goodness nobody was, was injured or killed, so the uh, Shellsworth Church bombing, the statute had run. But there's another section of the law that says there's no statute of limitations if uh, there's a, a death or an injury, bodily injury, or if the explosive is dangerously near to an occupied dwelling. And Shellsworth Church was out in a section where it was about a foot on either side from houses. So we tracked down who lived in those houses in 57, and we didn't actually charge him with bombing the church, which was what he bombed. We charged him with setting off an uh, explosive dangerously near to the residence at such and such that was occupied by so and so. And that's what we convicted him of because there was no statute. Uh, then we got a tip that the Klan from Montgomery had done it and we wasted a few months there. Uh, I should have had enough sense to know that the Klan in Birmingham was mean enough. They didn't need any help from the Klan in Montgomery, but uh, <laughs> Uh, that wasn't a waste of time either because we solved another case where a, a black truck driver had been abducted simply because he was driving a grocery truck for the Winn-Dixie chain and, and, and killed and never had gone, had been unsolved, not even listed as a murder. But finally, uh, we got on to the, the uh, real group, the Chambliss group, and we started making some progress. And we realized as we got into that that the FBI, from the absolute beginning, within minutes after the bomb went off, that the Chambliss group was there, it was the only people they, was their suspects. They had reasons to, to know that we didn't know. And so they had only focused on that group. And as we got more and more into it and, and on the right track, I realized we needed to have uh, cooperation with the FBI. And I thought that uh, I'd be able to get it because I'd had a good record as, as DA and as Attorney General so far of cooperating with the FBI. So I went through channels and uh, they had uh, had no federal case pending because the statute had run, the file had been closed, so I, I thought they'd be glad to cooperate with us. And I never heard anything. And the months drug into years and uh, still didn't hear anything. They wouldn't tell me no, but they wouldn't tell me yes. We kept sporadically working on the case, but one day I was in Washington on unrelated business, and I had a good friend named Jack Nelson. And Jack was from Alabama. That's Jack's picture. And uh, Jack was, for over 30 years, uh, the bureau chief in Washington for the Los Angeles Times. Jack's very one of our most famous ever journalists in the nation. And Jack and I were friends, and I usually would go see him when uh, I went to Washington. And this particular night, he and I were out uh, eating, and uh, he said, by the way, you still working on that bombing case? And I said, well, yeah, but I'm afraid we're going to have to, uh, we're at a dead end. And I explained to him that uh, 
the FBI wasn't cooperating and, and we needed to, we were at a point where we were gonna probably have to give up if uh, we didn't get that cooperation. And we knew who did it and all that. And he said, well, if you want me to, I might can help you. I said, I, I, I think I, I got something that might help you get the FBI to work with you. And I said, sure, sure. So we talked about it a little while. I, finally, I went back to the hotel. He went home. Early the next morning, Jack called me at the hotel and said, uh, you had your coffee yet? And I said, yeah, three cups. He said, well, uh, you sure you want me to uh, help you uh, get, try to get the FBI to uh, work with you on that bombing case? I said, yeah, absolutely. We, we out of luck if, uh, if we don't. And uh, he said, all right. I said, I got something I'm going to try, but I wanted to make sure you felt the same way after you've had your coffee that you did after you had eight beers. <laughs> and so I said, uh, well, I do. And so uh, he said, well, all right. So I went on back, and I reckon a few weeks later, three or four, I got a call from Jack and said, I think you're going to be hearing something pretty soon, and I think you'll like it. And so a couple of weeks after that, I was on the road and I called the office and they said that I'd gotten a call from the special agent in charge of the Birmingham office of the FBI. And I returned it. He said, Mr. Baxley, now by then, two or three years had elapsed since we started the investigation, since I'd made the request a couple of years. One of the reasons I was so patient was because in the interim, uh, during that period, J. Edgar Hoover had died and I thought, well, things may change after, after that. But then we had several directors and interim directors and nothing changed. But this, so this a special agent charge, said, Mr. Baxley, uh, said about that uh, request you have uh, for working with you on that bombing case, uh, we'd like to come in and help you on that, like, just like it had been pending in a few days, you know. And so I said, great. He said, now we can't let our files go out of our office, but if you'll send somebody up here, uh, we'll, we'll uh, work with them and, uh, and, and get in the case with you. I said, great. So I thought, hallelujah. I was, uh, went back uh, to the office and uh, I had a new investigator, not, not new, but a, a different investigator from what I'd had uh, working on it named Bob Eddy. Bob had not done any work on that case. But I decided since we were gonna get the FBI stuff into it, I'd get a new fresh set of eyes on it rather than who had been working on it. So I said, Bob, I'm gonna, I want you to let go of all your cases. We'll reassign them. I want you to go to Birmingham. I explained it to him. I said, uh, go to the FBI office. They said they'd uh, give you secretarial help and work with you. And your, your one function the rest of the time I'm in office is to solve this bombing case. I said, take however long it takes you to go through our files and talk to our investigators, pick out how many of them you need help and how many lawyers you need help, and uh, go to Birmingham, get you either a motel room or a rent an apartment, the state will pay for it, and, and from now on, that's, that's your only assignment. So Bob familiarized himself, went to Birmingham, and uh, went to the FBI, and sure enough, they gave him an office. And, uh, but their definition of cooperation and mine were daylight and dark apart. If Bob knew enough to ask for something, they would get it for him and show it to him and let him make notes on it and whatever. But they didn't let him have just access to, to the files. Uh, if he didn't know enough to ask for something, they didn't tell him about it. And I didn't find out until Doug's case that they had stuff in those files that if, uh, if, if we'd have known about them then, we could have tried at least Blanton when we tried Chambliss. But uh, anyway, all's well that ends well, finally. Uh, but. Uh, and I, I got to say this, I do need to say this, uh, Doug mentioned this and he's right. I do not fault the FBI agents that handle the investigation at all. They were, they were great, great, great. They did a super job. What I faulted were the higher ups that made the decisions, uh, not those agents that worked on it. Those agents that worked on it are, 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 are to be commended. Uh, but uh, anyway, we got uh, making some progress, uh, and we, we uh, before their files, we'd, even, we'd located a witness uh, It turned out to be one of our two major witnesses named Miss Curtis Glenn. That's her picture there. And she had been visiting in Birmingham the night of the bombing. She didn't live in Alabama. Uh, she was visiting friends, 
right behind uh, the church. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, it was a hot night, but they were sitting out on the uh, porch overlooking an alley between the church and, and the house she was in. And she noticed a uh, car come in and park in that alley. And when the people got out, the lights came on. She noticed there were four white men in the car. And she knew that was suspicious for that to, uh, to be occurring at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so she wrote down the tag number of that car and got a perfect description of it and had given it to uh, various law enforcement authorities, including the FBI. And the FBI took it seriously and had her come down and uh, look at a bunch of pictures. And she only was able to identify one, but that one she identified was Chandler's as being in the front passenger seat. And so Ms. Glenn, had, we couldn't find her for a while, but we finally located her in Detroit. And so I sent the investigators up there, and uh, uh, they came back, and uh, came, uh, the chief investigator came to report to me and said, uh, well, said, I got good news and bad news for you about Ms. Glenn. I said, what you want to hear first? I said, well, uh, tell me the good news. He said, well, Ms. Glenn is a very nice lady, very intelligent, very honest, comes across good. Uh, a jury would like her. Uh, she nails Chambliss, and she describes Blanton's car to a T, and it's just like it's fresh in her memory. Uh, I said, well, good gosh, what can be the bad news? And they said, well, she said that she's not coming back to Alabama under any circumstances. Now, back then, uh, we couldn't make a witness come from out of state. Now, I think every state has reciprocal witness laws, and if you... Uh, and they, they can compel the courts in, in Kansas to order somebody in Kansas to go testify in Alabama and vice versa. But back then you couldn't do that. And so I said, well, y'all didn't explain it to her right, that things are different now and this is serious. And I said, go back up there and tell them so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. He said, we did that. And I said, no, you go back and tell them. I said, let me write down what you tell them. So I sent them back up there. And they came back and said, she is nice as she can be. Both times she's put out little goodies and cookies for us, but she says she's not coming back to Alabama. I said, all right, we'll go to plan C. And I, at that time, by then, I'd hired quite a few uh, African Americans uh, in the AG's office, but none of them had been working on this case. But I thought, now, who is the most uh, outgoing, presentable uh, of, the, of the black attorneys that I've got? And I settled on Milton Belcher. He had been president of his uh, high school student body and a uh, 95% uh, high school and very, very personable young man. So I said, Milton, I got him up there and I said, you go up back with him and you talk to this lady, you familiarize yourself enough with it where you can talk with her and you convince her to come back to Alabama. So they went back up there third time now. They came back and said, she is not coming. She, she put out the goodies again. I said, Am I the only one in this whole office that can get anything done? Come on, I'll go. I'll show you how to do it. So we went back fourth time. She's just exactly what they said. Puts out the goodies. I made what I thought was the most convincing reasoning argument for her to come back. She said, "Mr. Baxley said, I'm sorry you've wasted a trip. Said I, you, you're obviously a nice man. I can tell. All these people that have been up here before are nice." I said, I am not only, but I've tried to make it so clear, I am not only not coming to Alabama. I wouldn't fly over to Alabama in an airplane. I wouldn't even allow my remains, if I was deceased, to be flown over <laughs> Alabama. There's no way I'm coming. As I'm going between, by then, dis total despair and anger, and I went over there to the little goody tray, and I noticed she had a, uh, a jet magazine. And that Jet Magazine was uh, years old, but it was mostly about the Montgomery bus boycott. And I picked it up, and it just the page it opened to was a picture of Ms. Rosa Parks on one page with her attorney, who was a guy named Fred Gray. And on the other page was a picture of Dr. King with his attorney, Fred Gray. And Fred Gray, but by then was a friend of mine, was one of the first two blacks elected to the uh, Alabama legislature. That's Fred's picture. So 
it was a good picture of him uh, with Dr. King and with Miss Parks. And so I said, Miss Glenn, uh, uh, you see this picture of, this, of Dr. King and Miss Parks with their lawyer, Fred Gray? And she says, yes, I'm very familiar with that. I said, if Fred Gray, the man that Dr. King trusted with the absolute birth of the Civil Rights Movement, the man he turned to when it started, if Fred Gray were to come up here and sit down and tell you you needed to come back to Alabama, would you come? And she said, well, I would certainly consider it. Now, that was such a sea change. I said, all right, boy, we're out of here, we're out of here. Let's go before she changes her mind. So we get out, and I said, stop at the first pay phone you come to. Back then, we still had pay phones. So we stopped a couple of blocks away, and I called Fred and got him on the phone, explained it to him, sent the state plane back. Fred dropped everything, came up there. Next morning, we went back to see Ms. Glenn. She put the goodies out. She was, uh, she was nobody's fool. Before she would talk to him, she got Fred up there, got that magazine out, opened it to those pictures, held it up there beside Fred's head. <laughs> and thank goodness he didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't age. You know, he, he still was, looked young. She looked back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. She said, well, it is you. Okay, what do you want to tell me? <laughs> and so Fred, who later became the first uh, African-American president of the Alabama Bar Association, terrific lawyer, Fred convinced her to, that she would agree to come back, and she was one of the two best witnesses. We never would have convicted Chambliss without her. But um, I'll get to the trial, I'll tell a couple of stories there, and then a couple of qu quick wrap-ups and turn it back to Doug. Uh, trial went as well as we could expect. We had 10 whites and two blacks on the jury. Uh, he was defended by Art Haynes, Sr. and Jr. They were terrific lawyers and friends. Uh, Art uh, was on the city commission in Birmingham, Art Sr. But they were good lawyers. They were tough. You, they put up a huge fight in any case you had against them, but they were ethical. They wouldn't, wouldn't hit below the belt. They were just good, good people, good kind of lawyers you you respect. And so they represented Chamless and did as great a job as could be done. But uh, the last witness, they said they were going to put up evidence, and they did. And the last witness they called, this was well into the trial, was Chamless's nephew, who was a Birmingham City policeman. And I cross-examined him and did about as good a job, in fact, probably as, as good a job as I ever in my life did on cross-examination and, and ripped him up pretty well. And so as he came down, Art Sr. stood up and said, we'll now call our final witness. We'll call Robert Chamless to the stand. And so his, his nephew was walking out, and Art said that. Chamless spoke up and said, nope, nope, I ain't getting up there. And so <laughs> and, and the jury, of course, heard all that. So I spoke up quickly and said, what did he say, Judge? What did he say? And he said, nope, nope, I'm not getting up there. And he getting louder and louder. He started, and I kept saying, what did he say? And he kept getting louder and repeating it. The judge was banging the gavel, got the jury out. And, uh, of course, we all learned uh, – First few weeks of law school, one the biggest probably no-no in prosecutions. You can't comment on the defendant not taking the stand, but I figured if I was just saying, what did he say? And Chambliss was the one doing the comment, that that was a risk I'd run. And so uh, that was about as good a way to end the trial. Uh, uh, the judge sent the jury out and let the Haineses put on the record that uh, they were caught totally by surprise, which they were. And they, uh, So that's the way it ended. And then we, the next day we started the arguments, and that's the second part of the story I'll tell. Uh, like that, Chamlin said, just blind luck. I couldn't have orchestrated that. Uh, it fell to my final part of the summation, uh, starting back after lunch, and the other arguments had taken all morning. And so I walked around downtown Birmingham by myself, and I came back to the courtroom, uh, getting ready to do mine. Uh, one of my assistants, John Young. Uh, said, Baxter, come up here a minute. He was up there getting the exhibits ready. And I said, no, no, Young, I'm, I'm, get, uh, I'm, I'm getting my thoughts together. He said, come up here. Let me show you something. I said, no. He said, yes, Baxter, you stubborn goat. You need to see this. I said, all right. So I go up there and he hands me state's exhibit one, our one. And it was Denise McNair's death certificate. And Hers was the only one case we were trying was Denise McNair. Uh, I got four separate indictments. That was the one we went to trial on. And so I looked at it, 
And I said, all right, so it's uh, Denise's death certificate. So what? He said, you clown? I said, look there at her uh, date of birth. And her date of birth was that day. And not only did I just fall into that, that uh, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I didn't have enough sense to know what I was looking at when he was showing it to me, pointing it out to me. But that gave me a way to end my argument. And so I had spread out all the exhibits on the jury rail, all the horrible, gruesome pictures of the girls and the damage like some of the pictures Doug showed you of the church. And, and uh, on the end, I had uh, Denise's birth certificate. So after I finished, I think it was over an hour arguing, I picked up, I said, when you go back with all these exhibits, I said, this is State's Exhibit 1, and I want you to look at that. And there's one thing that I want to call your attention to about. I said, look at her date of birth. If it hadn't been for that bomb, they'd be probably having a, a birthday celebration tonight at the McNair house. They'd probably be talking about maybe school, maybe a new job, maybe grandchildren, uh, maybe marriage plans, who knows. But it's not going to be a joyous night tonight at the uh, McNair house. It never will be on this day. And I said, you 12 people are going to have an opportunity to do something that no other people on earth will ever do. You're going to be able to give a wonderful birthday present to Denise McNair. And it's one I believe she's going to absolutely know about. You're going to be the 12 people that can finally bring her killer to justice. And I sat down. And several of the jurors had teared up. And that's, that combined with what Chamless had done was the first two times I really had got my hopes up a little bit. And sure enough, the jury the next day uh, found Chamless guilty. And uh, uh, so I'm going to tell two other stories and then turn it back to Doug. Uh, and both of those were blind luck, that, like I say, just some, a higher power looking after us. And you're going to hear a lot more of that from Doug in his trials. But I learned this story from Art Jr. After the jury found him guilty, he'd been out on bond. So he had, he'd, he'd uh, been on bond. But when he was found guilty, they lock him up. So Art Sr. made Art Jr. go out to tell Ms. Chamless that uh, the jury had found him guilty. And so uh, Art Jr. said he went up there and as he walked up to the uh, door, he noticed that all the curtains and blinds were drawn and the house was kind of dark, he could tell, even though it was in the afternoon. And uh, so he knocked on the door and he said, somebody said, come in, the door's unlocked. So he walked in and said, Miss Chamis is in this dark house in the middle of the day and she's got her house robe on, laying on the couch with a wet cloth on her forehead. And he said, uh, Ms. Chandler said, uh, Daddy told me to come over here and tell you that uh, the jury just found uh, Bob guilty and said, uh, he's in jail. You need to get him some, some stuff up and take to him. Uh, uh, she says, he's in jail? I said, yeah. When will he be coming, coming out? He said, well, it's going to be a, a long while. I said, we uh, are going to appeal the case, but he, he can't get out on a first-degree murder conviction on, on appeal. He can't make bond. And we'll appeal it. It's going to probably take a year and a half, two years to get it through appeal. I said, uh, and we're going to fight it as hard as we can. But said, frankly, uh, Dad wanted me to tell you that the judge has got a pretty clear record, and uh, it's going to be hard to get this one set aside. Uh, I said, uh, we're going to give it our, everything we got. She said, y you telling me you don't think he's going to be coming home? And he said, at his age, on a life sentence, uh, it's very unlikely that he'll ever uh, get out of jail again. And she said, you mean he won't ever be in this house again? I said, that's what I'm, I'm afraid, that, that, that's what it looks like, Miss Janice. That's what I'm coming to tell you. And he said, she jumped up threw that rag across the room, hit the wall, started dancing around saying, Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah, glory, glory, glory. And letting the blinds up and the curtains up and dancing around. And what they didn't know, the Haynes's, didn't realize that uh, the Chamless women, uh, the other great witness we had was his niece. But they had been cooperating with us and had been cooperating from the get-go with the FBI. In fact, Miss Chamless had let the FBI put a bug in their cuckoo clock, but it never did pick up anything except cuckoo in. But uh, <laughs> uh, now I'm going to tell the last, last little story, and this is my favorite one. 
After I left office, uh, the next few AGs that came in wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole, a 100-foot pole, because they thought it was unpopular. And so the biggest regret that I had in my public career was that I wasn't able to finish the job. There were still two more of those people. One of them had died. Two more people out loose. And I had a lot of regrets about that. And so uh, what I didn't know, and I wish I'd known then, that there was a kid going to law school in Birmingham during that trial, and he was cutting class and came and watched nearly every bit of it. And if I had known then that 20, nearly 25 years later that kid would be the United States Attorney in the Northern District and would pick up that case and finish what I couldn't finish, I'd have had a lot less sleepless nights. But Doug Jones was sitting down there watching that trial, and Doug came in and started it and finished the job I couldn't finish and convicted the other two. And Doug will always be one of my heroes. Thank you. All right, real quick, I got to tell uh, one thing uh, about, about Bill. Uh, he, he, you know, the state of Alabama would have been a far different place. When I tried my cases, we didn't get any blowback. Bill did. Bill got a lot of hate mail, a lot from outside of Alabama even, uh, and he kept it. He kept a file, and I've, he gave me a copy of the file, and some of the stuff that was written would just curl your hair. I mean, it's just incredible what people would put down uh, in, in, in letters then. The emails are easy to do now, but, but in letters. And one of them in particular stood out, and it was from this guy named Ed Fields, who was a chiropractor in Atlanta and head of the state's rights party with J.B. Stoner. So you can imagine his, his bent. And he sent about a three-page just absolute diatribe, blasting Bill, calling him every name in the book, uh, said he was a, a disgrace to his race for persecuting these good, white, Anglo-Saxon Christian men. Well, Bill, I got to tell you, was an amazing politician. He was a lieutenant governor uh, later in the 80s. He should have been governor. Uh, in 1978, I think he lost in part because of this case. But like most good politicians, he always tried to answer his mail. So he didn't answer a lot of the hate mail, but he decided to answer Dr. Fields. He had just had enough. And so he wrote the Attorney General letterhead, that golden ball seal of the state of Alabama in the Attorney General's office. He just said, Dear Dr. Fields, in response to your letter of February 19th, kiss my ass. <laughs> Now, I got to tell you, we, we, we didn't get any blowback, and I was dying to have something that I could write on Department of Justice letterhead and watch Janet Reno's expression when she saw our U.S. attorney saying, kiss my ass, but it never happened. All right, I'm going to try to go through this. I told you we'd run a little bit late, but I'm going to try to get through this as quickly as I can. We indicted our cases in state court in May of 2000. Uh, we were going to try the cases together. They were separate indictments. We had an issue concerning Cherry's competency, and so we had to separate the cases uh, and get him evaluated. So I ended up trying two cases, Blanton in uh, April of 2001 and Cherry in uh, April and May of 2002. When we finally got the cases to trial, with all the publicity and all the attenuating stuff from all over the country, really the world, focus on these. We finally got the cases to trial and on the first day of trial, um, which quite frankly was in the same courtroom where I watched as a, as a kid, which was kind of amazing to me to be there, uh, we had incredible support from the family members. This is the front row of the courtroom on the opening statements. That's Miss Robertson and her daughter. Uh, it's the McNair family. It's the Collins sisters. Um, just an incredible support group for the team that was putting so much time and effort in this. And one of our first witnesses was Miss Alpha Robertson, whose daughter Carol died in the blast. And Carol, uh, Miss Robertson, testified about being at home that morning when the bomb exploded. Carol had gone to Sunday school earlier to get ready for the youth worship service. And she lived, they just lived a few blocks from the church, and she was in the bathroom getting ready for the, uh, uh, to go to church when the bomb exploded, and I asked Miss Robertson, what did it sound like? She said, you know, it sounded like the whole world was shaking. 
And truly, folks, that's what happened. That's why there were so many changes that can't follow this, was because the whole country, the whole world did shake when four innocent children were murdered in a bomb in a house of worship on a Sunday morning. And Mrs. Robertson was an amazing witness for us. She just set the tone for both cases, talking about the whole world shaking. And to go back, Bill was talking about those things that just fall into place. You know, as trial lawyers, you not only prepare, you have to work so hard to try to get things, but every now and then, on cases like this especially, especially so old, things do just have to fall just right, and you have to have a little bit of luck. And it happened for us just like it did Bill. As I sat in the balcony and watched the most remarkable closing argument I have ever seen to this day, uh, with not a dry eye, it wasn't just a couple of jurors, there was not a dry in the courtroom, including the 24-year-old kid uh, in the balcony, watching Bill talk about Denise McNair's birthday and how fortuitous that was for his closing. When we started our case against Blanton, I did my opening statement, call Miss Robertson as my first witness on a day that would have been Carol's 50 first birthday, 51 years old, and, and you could just feel the courtroom change. You could see the jury, you could just feel the change as people now understood that this case was more than just simply about history that we've all read about. It was about people, it was about victims who had never felt the full measure of justice that everybody in the room, uh, in this room is so very proud of, and it was a palpable feeling and, and change. And so then our next witness was Reverend John Cross. Reverend Cross was the minister. He had retired to Atlanta and came back and forth, testified for Bill, testified in both of my cases, had always lived with the guilt of these girls' death because he knew, he knew from the very beginning by, that by allowing the church to be the mass meeting place for the children's marches that he put a bullseye on them and he lived with their guilt. He established, he identified all the photographs that I showed you. He talked about going around. He was in the sanctuary. And he had to go outside to go into, and everybody was holding back, not wanting to go in the window, through the window to the ladies' lounge. But he knew from the timing that the odds are that there's somebody down there. And he said he went and they started removing the, the debris. And they found the first body. And then he testified like you would expect from an old southern gentleman. He said they then found another body almost directly below, and then another body directly below her, and then the fourth. He said they were, they, it was as they had been stacked like cordwood. He was just a, an amazing witness uh, for us and really, really set out not only the desegregate, everything that was going on in the city that really pointed the finger at why this church and these children were targeted. Junie Collins was Addie Mae's sister. She was across the, the basement counting the Sunday school money when the, uh, it, uh, the bomb went off. She talked about coming to Sunday school and they'd gotten a little angry that day because they were fighting over a ring with Addie Mae and she never got to apologize to her. She's had a very difficult time. Um, you know, in those days, victims, especially if you were a black victim uh, to a white crime, you just got swept under the carpet. And that's not good for the psyche of, of, of victims. And she got sweat, and she's had a difficult time over the years, especially in part because she had had a little fight with Addie Mae and never got to apologize. The next time she saw her, she had to identify her body in the makeshift morgue. Then there was Eunice Davis, who was Cynthia's sister. They were living apart as Cynthia lived with the Wesley family. And she heard about her sister's death on the radio that afternoon and had to go get her mom to go to the Wesley family um, to find out everything that had happened and to mourn with them. Then there was Maxine McNair. Maxine took Denise to Sunday school and church that morning. Denise was going to participate. They stopped at the, at the as she testified, they stopped at the, at the steps inside the church and Denise went downstairs and uh, Maxine went upstairs to the choir loft, which was almost directly above the ladies' lounge. That's where her Sunday school class was meeting. And I asked her, what was the reaction when the bomb exploded? What was the reaction? Because there were so many people in the sanctuary in their Sunday school classes. She said it was just bedlam. People were scared. They didn't know. There were some injuries. People were running around. They didn't know if it was a bomb. They didn't know if a plane had crashed. They were just, it was that kind of panic situation. I said, Miss McNair, what was your reaction? She said, I just screamed, my baby, my baby because she knew that bomb and explosion had occurred below right where Denise, and there are some just gut-wrenching photographs 
of her, her father, Mr. Pippin, bringing Denise's shoes over to her after he helped load Denise's body on the, on the gurney to go to the hospital. Her husband, Chris, was a Lutheran, went to a different church, heard about the bombing only and, and, and went straight to 16th, only to be told that he really needed to go to UAB Hospital, it was known as Hillman Hospital then, to identify the body of his only daughter, Denise. And he walked in and there she was, still with a piece of mortar embedded right in the middle of her skull. Chris kept that mortar. He was a photographer and he had this studio that he had a memorial room to Denise with her shoes and a Bible and other memorabilia and he had that piece of mortar and when, I'm sorry, 10 minutes. <laughs> if anybody needs to leave, please feel free. I've, I raised two teenage boys. I'm used to people walking out on me when I talk. So <laughs> he, still, he kept that piece of mortar on display and I finally, we had been friends for many years and I finally asked him, I said, Chris, why do you do that? It, it just seems a little over the top. He said, Doug, let me tell you, people come by here all the time and they want to learn about the bombing and they want to learn about the girls and they mourn for the girls and they learn the history. But until they see the piece of mortar that was embedded in my daughter's head, they really can't fully appreciate what people can do in the name of hate. And I never questioned him after that and our jury got to hold that piece of mortar in both of our cases. These families were just amazing. They, they truly believe in our system of justice despite the delays. They truly believed in our system of justice uh, and waited patiently uh, for the wheels of justice to turn and they were so different than the defendants and all their cronies in this case. This is a photograph of Bobby Cherry. Uh, Cherry had moved to Texas in the 1970s and he was living in Maybank, Texas when we indicted him in state court. A year, year or so in 1997, right before I became U.S. Attorney, the investigation had been ongoing for a little bit and they decided to go interview Cherry. Now Cherry, I got to tell you, having looked at all of his interviews, Cherry was the kind of person that you knew from moment to moment as a human being he was telling you a lie. He was telling you something that was not true because you knew that when he was doing it his lips were moving and he was not going to tell you the straight story. And at our trial we had like seven or eight old FBI agents that came and talked about all the times they interviewed Cherry and the inconsistencies and just falsehoods that he, that he told. Uh, throughout the time my PowerPoint and my closing outline that and it was pretty damning. I tell kids all the time, you know, you better be careful what you say to law enforcement because you know the judges will charge. It's evidence of, of guilt. And it was damning what Cherry did. But the worst thing that he did when was when he was interviewed in 1997, he, he said a few things that we used at the trial, but what he did afterwards, he went and hired a lawyer. Now you would think that that was a good thing, right? Well, okay, lawyers. What this guy did was after he met with Cherry, he let Cherry talk to the media. Now, if you don't take anything out of this, never let your client talk to the media, for God's sakes. Never let them talk. Because when he talked to the media, and it was shown on television in Texas and back in Birmingham, the phone started ringing at the FBI offices. And one of the first people that called was this young lady, Teresa Stacy. Bobby Cherry's granddaughter. And one of the first things she said to the dispatcher, she said, thank God y'all are finally looking at this case. Everybody knows my grandfather was involved in it. He used to brag about it. And she came and she testified about all the times. As, and she was estranged from the family. We didn't get any other help from any of the Cherry family. Um, but all the times at Sunday dinners when they would talk incessantly about what all had happened in Birmingham and how Cherry would brag about being part of the group that would terrorize the black community and part of the group that bombed the church and killed those girls. She withstood some incredible cross-examination, but she stood absolutely strong with all of Cherry's statements to her. It came off so credible. And she, was, she was the only family member, the only blood relative. This is, this is uh, Willa Dean Brogdon. Willa Dean was Cherry's third wife. Three out of five uh, wives for Bobby Frank Cherry. These guys were also abusers, by the way, which is why the Chambliss women were, in fact, uh, cooperating a little bit. And Willa Dean, again, with things just falling into place, when I became U.S. Attorney, my agents briefed me on this. They didn't know all my history, but they were briefing me, and they said they're looking for Cherry's third wife, Willa Dean. They were only married a couple of years, and they were in the early 70s, and they were trying to find her. 
I said, okay, well, what all have you done? He said, well, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, and we've been spending a year on it, and we can't find her. I said, what do you mean you can't find her? They said, we don't have a clue where she is or what she's doing. I said, for God's sakes, you're the modern FBI. You can't find a 73-year-old woman in this country? He, they just hung their head and said, no. And here's what happened. A year later, when we started our grand jury, it got some publicity. Uh, and it got splashed all over. And a, a reporter from Mississippi came over and did a story that hit the wire services. And Willa Dean Brogdon saw that story in her little hometown newspaper in Glendive, Montana and called the FBI agents in Bozeman and said, I need to come see you about this. I know about this matter. I, I was married to this guy, and I need to come talk to you. And she drove 200 miles to tell the story of being married to Bobby Cherry and how he would prance around in his clan robes and how the time that her, his car broke down right by the church and when she came to pick him up, he talked about where they placed the bomb, pointed to the steps where he said that they had placed the bomb uh, for the church bombing. And every time he would get angry at her and she would scoff at him, he would, and, 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 and he'd say, I'm going to kill you if you do that again. And she'd scoff and he said, look, I've killed before and I'll kill again. He would talk about we're trying to work on the fuse and the fact that it didn't always work right. Uh, it, she even recorded some of him talking in his sleep because he had nightmares about this. And in, in a, a telling conversation she, she would say that on the one hand Sherry would say you know no one was supposed to get injured in this case the, 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 uh, in this blast the bomb didn't go off when it was supposed to and in the very next breath his racism would come out and he would talk about these young, young girls as if they were animals and say well they weren't supposed to get hurt but at least they can't breed that was the kind of folks that we were dealing with I got tons of stories if you want me to talk about Willa Dean she was a, she was a kick we had another one, Bobby Birdwell, who is, uh, I don't have a photograph of Bobby. He was friends of Cherry's son, oldest son, Tom. And he ca called us to tell us that that weekend, the weekend before, he was in the Cherry household. He had been playing, and he saw Cherry's clan robes, and it kind of scared him. And then he saw men sitting around the table with Cherry, and they were talking about the bomb and the bomb being ready and talking about 16th Street. And I asked him, or my colleague asked him, why didn't you report that? after this bombing, you were old enough to understand. He said, man, I was a white kid in a Klansman's house. I was scared to death, and I wasn't even going to tell my parents. And he kept quiet and moved away and came back only to see the news and call the FBI. And then finally there was uh, Michael Goins. Michael was uh, suffering from em emphysema when we got to him. He called us to talk about a time in 1980. Cherry had moved to Dallas and had a carpet cleaning business. And Michael was living in Dallas in 1980. Uh, cleaning the apartments that his mom was managing, and Cherry came to clean the apartments. And in 1980, and this I think is also important in today's, and, and really in the last few years, the political climate that we are in right now. In 1980 that they are talking, complaining, raising hell about the rise of the Hispanic population in Dallas, Texas in 1980. And Cherry's response, and this is Michael's testimony, and I apologize for the language, but it is what it is. Because Cherry said, well, you know, we just need to handle the wetbacks the same way we handled the niggers in Birmingham. And he went on to talk about how they handled the niggers in Birmingham by blowing up the church that killed those little nigger girls. Now, I got to tell you, folks, we're on a rocky path right now. We are on a rocky path, and I hope everybody in this room will remember the words of Michael Goins and Cherry from 1980 uh, so that we don't repeat the same mistakes that we've had in the past. They were awesome witnesses. Came through, they did not ask for anything, didn't want anything, but came forward to do the right thing some 37 years earlier. Blanton was a lot different. Blanton kept to himself, a real hermit. He did go to law school. He went to Birmingham School of Law, which is an unaccredited school. Thank God, folks, he never passed the bar, so he's not a brother lawyer. But <laughs> He, he did become a very prolific Freedom of Information Act requester. Probably had a file bigger than mine. And, and his case was a lot different because he did keep quiet. But two weeks before the bombing, the man you see in this photograph with a bullhorn and a white hat named James Lay was a, 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 a volunteer, a volunteer group that would ride around at night to try to protect the homes of the civil rights leaders uh, and the churches. He worked at the post office. 
And he told the agents and he told us that at the time, uh, two weeks before the bombing, he's riding by 16th Street at six at 1 o'clock in the morning. And he sees a car parked on the side of the road uh, right there by those steps that later blew up. And there was a white man standing by the car and there was a white man standing over there by those steps holding what Mr. Lay called a grip. It would have been a backpack or a gym bag, something along those lines. He called it a grip. And when he hit his bright lights, they took off. Well, he got a friend. They looked around, didn't see anything. They called the Birmingham police, and the Birmingham police said, Boy, you're just going home. You didn't see a damn thing. You know, boy was the name given to all black men by the Birmingham police, regardless of age. Just going home, boy, you didn't see a damn thing. Well, two weeks later, this bomb explodes, and he tells the FBI what he saw, and they confirm what had happened with the police, and they brought him up, and they show him a hundred or so pictures that the FBI had taken of other Klansmen, the usual suspects, so to speak. And out of all of those photographs, he picked two people that he believes are the ones he saw that night. Not 100% sure. Eyewitness testimony rarely is. But the man by the, the car, Dynamite Bob Chambliss, that actually prosecuted, and the man holding the grip by the steps, Tommy Blanton. Strong, strong circumstantial evidence for Mr. James Lay. So Blanton and Chambliss were suspects early on, in part because of that and in part because of Mrs. Glenn who uh, B Bill talked about, who saw the Blanton automobile at 2 o'clock in the morning behind the church. Now, Miss um, Glenn had passed away also by the time I got this case, so we couldn't use her testimony from the trial. Uh, try as I might to try to you know, pull every trick in the book that I knew to get the defense to open the, the door that I could use that transcript, it, it didn't work. And the fact of the matter is, the defense lawyer was a former partner of mine who I had raised as a baby lawyer, so he knew all my tricks, and he didn't take the bait. But I did get out the time. The time at 2 o'clock in the morning was important because when Blanton was first interviewed at the time of that photograph, he could not remember where he had gone on Saturday night. He had remembered he had picked his girlfriend, Jean, up because he had broken the date the night before. And he picked her up about 5 or 6 o'clock, but he had no idea where they went. Couldn't remember anything. The only thing he remembered was he had her home by midnight because that was her curfew. She was only 17. He was about 22. And he had her home by midnight, and then he went home and went to bed. Well, when the agents confronted him about having a witness seeing his car, well, he clams up. And by his admission and his girlfriend, Jean's, they now get that story together. And they know exactly where they went. They went to Ed Salem's drive-in. Then they went up to Vulcan and went parking. And yes, he had her home by her curfew, but now they remember that he fell asleep on her sofa and didn't leave for, uh, uh, until 2.45 in the morning. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that alibi kept him out of jail. Now, they got married later on when they became a focus of this. That's another thing about how the marital privilege comes into play with, you know, they got married, then they, as soon as the case got closed out, they got divorced, then Bill opened it up, they got remarried. Then they get, when Bill leaves office, they get divorced again. And I, and, and I will tell you, through the years, even when I talked to her, she stood by her man. You know, go to iTunes, look up Tammy Wynette, stand by your man, you'll see Gene's picture, I guarantee you. That alibi kept him out of jail for so, so long until we found other evidence. But because he was a suspect, FBI enlisted an informant, Mitch Burns. Mitch was a Klansman, not a violent guy. And for two years, he was enlisted to ride around with Tommy Blanton. They had a tape recording put in uh, Mitch's car. And on tape, because every time they would go, you know, by this time, the uh, Klan thought the FBI was wiretapping all of their phones, and bugging their houses, bugging the car. So he would want to go in. And by the way, J. Edgar Hoover was doing that. Uh, it, was not, it was not, you know, unfounded. They'd want to go in, he'd want to go in Mitch's car. Well, he didn't know that Mitch was an informant, so they had that car bugged. And there was a recorder. We played about 26 excerpts. I can't go through them all here. But he would talk about things he would do when he bombed his next church. They went to pick up Cherry one time, and there was a conversation where uh, he pulled in an alley and said, this is the alley we almost missed the night we bombed the church. And inside, Mitch remembered Cherry talking about the fuse uh, and, throwing, and lying to the FBI and talking about the, uh, the throwing the FBI off on, on where the bomb was made. Mitch was a great witness for us, but I got to tell you, I, I know we're running late, but you got to hear this story. <laughs> you know, I mean, as, as emotional as this case was, there's always a funny moment. And Mitch, it, well, let me put this back, context for me. I'm U.S. attorney. I'm leaving office. I was a Clinton U.S. attorney. I'm leaving office in the spring. This is 
uh, April of 2001. President Bush is already in. Uh, President Clinton had left office under a little cloud of controversy. The reason that the FBI identified Mitch is because that Blanton lived next door to a lady named, uh, and her husband named Marie Aldrich. And she was a waitress at the restaurant where Mitch always ate. And he always went to her, her table. And yeah, they got sweet on each other. They started seeing each other outside. We disclosed all of that to them. We had the love letters back and forth. And so the defense lawyer couldn't cross-examine Mitch except, I mean, the tapes spoke for themselves, except for being, you know, Klansman and having, uh, and, and about Marie. So he started out, at, just as you would ex expect, building the relationship up with Marie, asking, you know, about her being a, a, a waitress and that he would see each other and they saw each other outside of marriage. After about five or six questions, everybody in the courtroom, including the third graders that were visiting up, up uh, from one of the elementary schools, knew that there was a little hanky-panky going on between Mitch and Marie, but John could not, John Robbins, couldn't resist asking the $64,000 question. It didn't the fact you were having an affair with Marie Aldridge. You know, Mitch just leaned back and then he leaned up to the microphone, put his finger up and said, I did not have a sexual relationship <laughs> with that woman. <laughs> Cracked everybody. I mean, he, but a, a, a great witness. All right, I'm going to roll through this a little bit. John Colvin was a, uh, uh, John Colvin was a, uh, worked for the FBI. He was in their electronic sur surveillance. He was not an agent. But he pretended to be a truck driver and rented the apartment next to Gene and Tommy Blanton. And they tore out a wall and he put one of J. Edgar Hoover's famous little bugs underneath the kitchen sink. It was actually a hole in the wall that they put right next to it. They ran it to a telephone line that went back to a tape recorder. Uh, and in the June of 1964, they catch on tape a conversation between Gene and Tommy that I'm hoping we can play. Three times, one of these guys admits being the group that planted the bomb, making the bomb. This tape, ladies and gentlemen, had been sitting in a box in the FBI office for 30-something years, hadn't been listened to since it was made. There were notes about it, but the FBI didn't think it could ever get into evidence. It was a different thing. It's another whole CLE program on how we got it into evidence. They never dreamed it would get into evidence, and it just sat there, and we found it after we indicted the cases. And i got to tell you, it just as important as that admission is, right there, Gene is talking about not telling him about Mary Lou Holt, who we believe knew all about this bombing. And so his alibi lied to the FBI. And now the alibi that kept him out of jail for so long doesn't even take the witness stand. And I met with Gene. I met with her before I turned this tape over. Her and her husband came in, and I played this tape. We talked about it. She never would help us. I played this tape over and over. I, and I, 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 I played this tape so many times, I swear I believe that when I start to leave and pass from this earth, I'm going to hear this voice going, Well, Tommy! <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm going to go the other way. And I told her, I said, Gene, you really need to help us because let me tell you something, this is a true story. I said, Gene, you need to understand something. He did go out with Waylene on that Friday night when he stood you up. 
Well, she was pretty pissed about that, but she still didn't help. But uh, she didn't testify. Now, I want to wrap up with a couple of things. When I became the U.S. attorney in 1997, my staff didn't know, uh, all of whom I knew very well, but they didn't know my history of watching Bill's case and my history with the McNair family. And so when I sat down with them, they said, don't get your hopes up, Doug. This is an old case. The evidence is stale. People are dying. People are dead. So don't get your hopes up. And my response was, if we don't do it now, it's probably never going to get done. And this community deserves at least for us to give it our best. And I didn't really realize how prophetic that might be. By the time we had another bombing in Birmingham and we got delayed a little bit and finally got these cases to trial, and we were successful. About a, two months before the Blanton trial started, our star witness, James Lay, has a stroke. He's in a nursing home in front of, out at Bessemer. And I go visit him and he still wants to try, to, he still wants to testify, but he can't talk. But he can move his head. And so I, you know the rules of evidence would have let me just put him on and ask him the grand jury questions. He was an incredible grand jury witness. And just see if they're correct. Is that true? Was that a true statement? And yes, Cross would have been non-existent. The day before... I was to call him, one of the FBI agents that was coming up from Tampa, Agent Frank Spencer, was being driven up. And I, I come in and my agent tells me that Agent Spencer has had heart failure and he is in intensive care in Montgomery, 90 miles south of Birmingham. So here we are with one star witness in a nursing home, the other in intensive care. And I bring Agent Spencer's daughter up, we talk, he ends up being okay. And I don't, we don't, still don't know exactly what happened, but he ends up being okay, and he drove up and testified about Blanton lying to him. His, the importance of him was so significant that when his doctor, who in Montgomery had never met, found out who he was, doing, what, who he was and what he was doing, canceled every appointment and came up there with him. We had, we had paramedics with a crash cart in the courtroom behind us just in case he had a problem. He ended up doing great, got off the stand, went back, to Tampa, but I got worried about Mr. Lay. So I cut a deal with the defense to let him do some cross. We read his grand jury testimony. My grand, my jury got to hear the evidence, but they didn't get to see this guy. Point of the story is after the Blanton case, he was only going to be a witness against Blanton. After the Blanton case, I go on vacation. And when I come back just 30 days after the conviction, I pick up the newspaper and I see where James Lay had died. I would have never gotten that testimony in uh, had he died before that trial. And he was just the first of several. After the Cherry case and the man who authenticated the tape, John Colvin, dies about 30 days after the Cherry case. About the time that I was going to his funeral, Miss Robertson calls me because we were going to New York in August and she says she can't go because some tests had come back bad. And I went to see her in the hospital. She, I was getting an award and she was going to accept one for the girls, but she couldn't go and I went to visit her. And on a Sunday afternoon in August, when I'm giving the speech, she passes away. Uh, she was a remarkable lady. I still miss her. We became very close. And her son, when I went to her memorial, her son afterwards came running over and he said, Doug, thanks again for coming. But more important, thanks for what you did. It was because of you she died with a smile on her face. I don't care what kind of case you have, folks. It just doesn't get much better than that. A couple of months after that, in, right in November, Two days before Thanksgiving, Mitch Burns wakes up and calls a friend complaining of severe chest pain, collapses on the floor of his warrior home and dies of a heart attack. Mitch lived and died a Klansman, but he never hesitated to come back uh, and do the right thing and to finish the job that he started. About a year after the Cherry case, it was Michael Goins who was suffering from emphysema. Shortly thereafter, Eunice Davis, Reverend Cross, Reverend Shuttlesworth, Mr. Armstrong, they, the, the list just gets, goes on and on. And it wasn't just the, the witnesses. About three years afterwards, Bobby Cherry dies in an Alabama prison, and I make no apologies. He should have been in that prison a long time ago. Final story, people tend to forget. Leave out a very important part of the history of this case. Uh, and that is about the sink. I mentioned it to you early because it was such an important part. Because history often leaves out. They talk about the four little girls, but they failed to mention that there were five little girls in that lady's lounge that morning. Four died and one survived. And the survivor was my last witness in both of my cases. She walked over to the sink. It was Sarah Collins Rudolph who still lives in Birmingham 
and is the sister of Addie Mae. And she talked about coming to Sunday school and church and trying to wash her hands at the sink. And as she got there, she heard Denise say something about her dress. And I asked her, what did you do? She said, well, I turned around and I looked into the room and I saw my sister trying to tie the sash of Denise's new dress. Well, then what happened? She said, well, then there was the explosion and I was buried underneath all the rubble and I couldn't hardly move. I couldn't see. She's still blind in one eye today. She stayed in the hospital about three months. She said, I just yelled. I, I, I couldn't hardly talk, but I tried to call out. I said, what did you do? She said, I called out for help. She said, tell me. What did you say? She said, I just called out for my sister. I called out, Addie, Addie, Addie. Her voice just rose in that courtroom just like it did some 37 years earlier. Did you ever hear her respond, Sarah? No, sir. Did you ever see her alive again? No, sir. And with that, I looked up at Judge Garrett and said, Your Honor, the state of Alabama rest its case. It was, folks, a remarkable ending it, for a remarkable story. It took about two hours to convict Blanton on the strength of that tape, about six to convict Cherry. And at the end of the day, I kept coming back to this Pope photograph. The photograph that I had picked because it was a father's favorite photograph of his daughter, but it kept gnawing at me. And the, the night before my closing argument in Cherry, I, come, I, I hit the wall that lawyers often hit in closing arguments. And I go in, and my daughter's watching a movie called The Shawshank Redemption. At the end of that story, they're reading a letter. And in that letter, it talks about hope. And that hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things. And good things never die. And that's what I told the jury. The next day that this image, this photograph captured everything about the case. It was an image of the kids who marched for freedom in Birmingham. It was the image of a mother's heart that never starts crying for the loss of a child. The image of the deaths of her children, the injuries to Sarah, but more important, it was an image of hope. A young black girl holding her best friend, a white chatty Kathy doll. And at that time, in that place in 1963, it was really the hope of a race of people in our country. But today, as our society gets ever more diverse and our planet gets smaller, it really should be the hope of us all. That we need to live together better, we need to love each other more. That we need to do the right thing by each other. And I will tell you, there are a lot of things that can be learned, and I'm going to be very candid about something. I've been giving this talk for 15 years. Bill and I do it all the time. But for some reason today, it just seems like the messages and the lessons have a little bit more urgency. We have things in this country, right or wrong, and this is not a political speech. People are afraid. People are concerned. It, time will tell whether their concerns are justified, but you can't ignore the fact that people are concerned. And, and recently, the Birmingham Civil Rights District was designated as a national monument. And I hope everybody will come to Birmingham and learn the lessons of the past and learn what Birmingham has done to try to get together a little bit more, to have dialogues instead of monologues, to not scream at each other, but just talk to each other. And at the end of the day, for lawyers, it is a lesson for us that that long road to justice can be quite long. But at the end of the day, we get there. And it took a while in this case, but it is just never too late for we as lawyers and judges to do the right thing to seek that truth, to seek the justice that everybody in this country deserves. So thank you again for letting us be here. We've really enjoyed it. I look forward to the rest of the conference. Thank you for letting us tell the story. Thank you.